All right. Well, hey, friends. Welcome to a bonus episode of Halfway There. We are really privileged. I can't wait to introduce uh, our guest. He actually was recently on the show. We're going to talk about beliefs today. Our guest is Cliff Ravenscraft. Cliff, welcome back to Halfway There. Well, dude, I am so excited to be here, and I had no idea I was going to be a bonus episode. Man, now yeah, I'm doubly honored. You are absolutely. So, I I have this kind of weird thing, and I'm, you're you're sort of the expert, so maybe you can tell me what to do here. But once people have been on the show, I tend to do bonus episodes with them if they come back because they've already shared their story, and I like to do this kind of. We're going to go more in depth on a topic that you're passionate about. It could just be an episode, I guess. Um, but I like to do bonus episodes. My regular Monday episodes are kind of the numbered ones, and then we throw in the extras. This is I'm I'm an extra I'm a slappy extra. It, <laughs> yeah, we already had your full story, Cliff. Why do I have to listen to you? Oh, no, you're not no. a full episode. I'm deleting. <laughs> it's all good. I'm just kidding. Well, I mean, it's still I'm seriously no, dude. I it it doesn't matter. Do whatever floats your boat. Right, the audience is gonna love you no matter what. I think so. I just uh, I like to keep those Monday ones. I don't know why. It's kind of a weird thing I have. So anyway, so we'll do a we'll do a bonus episode. And I wanted to you, we wanted to talk about beliefs, right? Which I think is a really interesting thing. So friends, if you want to go back to uh, Cliff's story, um, it was back in May of two thousand nineteen. I don't remember the episode number, um, but you can hear all about some of Cliff's beliefs, but. Uh, and how they changed and evolved, particularly in a religious uh, context, which I thought was really a fascinating story. But let's talk about beliefs. So um, I was wondering if you would just start us out and define what a belief is for us. Yeah. So I remember the day I was 44 years old. So it was only just over like two and a half years ago. I was 44 years old on my way home from the gym and I was listening to a Tony Ro Robbins program called, I think it was personal power too. And first time in my life I ever heard somebody state an actual definition for what a belief is. <laughs> and it rocked my world. And the, and I, so, so here's the exact words. A belief is nothing more than a thought that you feel certain is true. And I'm like, what? And I remember going back and listening to that like five times. A belief is nothing more than a thought that you feel certain is true. You see, Eric, for me, I used to believe that a, a belief was a fact, an indisputable fact, and that if you were one of those people that says, well, what's, what, what, what you believe to be true for you may not be true for everyone else and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, dude, no, we don't go there. No, that's that. Oh, that's slippery slope sort of stuff. It's it's what is that called? Um, there's a word for it that's that's dangerous in the Christian faith. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I can't. Slippery slope is that. going there. Yeah, it's kind of that backsliding, maybe getting there. Not backsliding. It's it's something about you know that it, things aren't true, but everything's like kind of just debatable. I I can't think of it. It doesn't matter. Relativism. So Relativism. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, tr truth is relative. See, the thing is, is I used to believe that beliefs dealt with truths and they don't. Yeah. All that beliefs are, are thoughts that you feel certain is true. See, I believe truth is truth and truth. Once something is true, it's true because God made it true. But there's all sorts of thoughts that I have that for a long time I believed were truths that God made true, and I was wrong. <laughs> right, right. They we, were not true. Which it's is like, why whoa. some t the process of growth, the whole process of the spiritual formation, is sort of undoing some of the wrong beliefs and living into the true ones about who you are and who God is. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's discovering, embracing, and then living out that true identity of God, who God created you to be. It, it, it's an ongoing journey of process, and unfortunately, it, to to be able to do it successfully, to navigate life successfully, unfortunately, we have to spend a great deal of our time uh, untangling ourselves from the beliefs that we've developed since our childhood. Right. Okay, so I'm I take it just knowing you, I know I kind of know the answer to this, but I want you to explain it for us. So it's okay then if these beliefs change. 
I, I, I would hope that they change, especially <laughs> the ones that are wrong. Right. Well, I ask that for a reason, right? Because I think sometimes, uh, and I know this in my own family, and I've felt this too, I feel like it, when my beliefs start to change, it feels a little bit uncertain, right? It feels like this isn't, this isn't okay. I don't know where, you know, if my, if my whole security was based on what I believe, whether it's a faith belief or a belief about myself, that can be unsettling. And so it could, but what if it could actually be the opposite? What if it could give you more certainty? What if all of a sudden the beliefs that you had actually created some uncertainty in your life? And it basically you've been living a lie the last 20, 30, 40 years of your life. And now all of a sudden, now you've uncovered that, oh my gosh, that was a lie. And no wonder I'm not experiencing the life that God promised. But no, lo- no wonder I'm not experiencing the life of my dreams. This belief has been holding me back. And now that I've, number one, become consciously aware of the belief, which by the way, we could talk about later if you want, yeah. if we get there. But anyway, once you become consciously aware of the belief and then you begin to evaluate that belief and ask some very important questions like, is it true? And then you realize it's not. And then all of a sudden you ask, okay, well, if that's not true, what's the opposite of that? What's the empowering belief that would replace that limiting belief, which I'm eliminating from my life from now on? And is there proof that that gives me more confidence and more certainty that I'm going to experience more of what God's been prepared for me my entire life anyway? What if it didn't actually cause you uncertainty, but actually gave you more certainty? I think that's very hopeful. I think it doesn't feel that way in the moment, though, or for sometimes, right? At least hasn't for me. I I would and yes. So what I I love that you fixed their, your language at the. It doesn't happen that way. But, but, but maybe for me. your experience so far has not been that way. I'm telling you it's potential for you, though, that you could see yeah. all shifted beliefs as beliefs that God's been revealing to you. And anything that God reveals to you, so shouldn't it give you more certainty? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's one of the things I love to talk about here is because that really falls into the realm of experience, right? As we, And then as we have more experience with God, we start to read things differently, even in Scripture, which um, does change our beliefs. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I want to know what are some beliefs about God that you had to change? And then like, how did that change? Um, you know, how, how did changing them and what were the consequences? Cause you also have this saying that all beliefs have consequences, right? All beliefs have consequences. Yeah. Every single belief you have has consequences. Some of the beliefs you have are awesome. And the consequences of those beliefs are really awesome results in your life because of what you believe, because of some of the awesome stuff that you believe that is true. You actually take actions based upon those beliefs that cause you to get results that you're really happy with. So even beliefs that are awesome have uh, consequences. They're just, they happen to be good consequences. The thing is though, is what we got to watch out for all the negative crap that's in our life. And I, I think you'd agree, Eric, we have all have way too much negative crap in our life. Absolutely. And yeah. it's all from negative beliefs that aren't true, by the way. So here's what I, uh, what was your question about the beliefs that I had about God that I had to change over time. So first of all, I believed that God was an angry God, that um, pretty much he demanded perfection and holiness from me. Uh, and he expected me to live a sin-free, righteous, holy lifestyle consistently. Now, not that he expected it from me right away. But I certainly needed to be work, walking towards it. Now, in all fairness, I will tell you that um, I grew up in the church, if you will. Uh, I, I, from the time I was a kid, there were times when I would go to Sunday school classes with the church van that went through our neighborhood. I'd go to vacation Bible school, depending on which one had the best flavored Kool Aid and cookies. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I went so I went to Baptist churches, uh, Wesleyan churches. I went to. Uh, Episcopalian churches. I went to Nazarene churches. I went to Pentecostal churches. I went to Assembly of God churches. I've been around the block. And oh, by the way, from second grade to seventh grade, I attended Catholic school as a non-Catholic, attending mass every Friday and religion class every Tuesday. Yeah, I have a little bit of an eclectic background in the faith area of who God is, Right. let's just say. (laughs) <laughs> but let's just but when I finally where where God finally got to me and, and started to wrestle with my heart and said, listen, I'd like you to devote yourself to f- 
full-time ministry. I'd like you to devote the rest of your life to serving people in whatever way I call you to serve them. I was, that was 22 years ago. I happened to be attending a Nazarene church at the time. Don't know how familiar you are with Nazarene theology or Wesleyan theology, but there's this thing called entire sanctification. Now, there are some people who teach it differently than others, but I, the, the little branch that I was a part of is holiness unto the word is the, or, or yeah, mm-hmm. anyway, is our watch and call or whatever. Holiness is, is, is it's like street, scream it, shout it loud and long, holiness unto the Lord now and forever. We are holy. We are blameless. We, we are going to live sin-free lives. God's going to break us free from any and all sin in our life and once we reach this attainment of entire Higher. <gasps> sanctification. <laughs> right. Well, let's just put it this way. I don't think I ever lived up to the entire <laughs> sanctification thing. I thought I did for a couple of days or hours or weeks at a time. And boy, was I self-righteous in those areas. Oh my gosh. The times when I really felt like I had it all under control, I, I was probably one of the worst people on this planet when it came to uh, anybody who who was a good example of of what God had to offer the world, boy, did that that theology lead me that belief lead me to a lot of self righteousness and and just a terrible terrible witness for God. Yeah, which I so, think is I think it's real interesting because Jesus basically he said it this way: you know, you judge a tree by its fruit, right? Which yes. is almost the same thing as all beliefs have consequences. It's really. That his way of saying it in a first century Jewish context. So when you can look at something like that and see what the result is, um, I've been mulling this over a lot going, okay, we're, you know, some people who seem to think that I'm a little bit out there because I'm, I'm growing in some ways. You're talking to me, dude. They think you're really way out of there. <laughs> they do. They me on a second time. <laughs> After that first time back in May, they're like, okay. Eric's gone off the deep end. He's a heretic. And Some of them he, do. Yeah, it's true. But that's, but anyway, they're, so they're looking, that's because some of my beliefs are changing, right? But yeah, my, that, know, but, that's why I say it's slippery slope. Cliff Ravenscraft, stay away from that dude. What's changing is, is that I, I'm wanting to love people more. I'm wanting to represent his, his Eric, grace. Eric, Eric, what's changing is you're wanting to love yourself more. Well, that is also true. Absolutely. Which is, oh, okay, we have to talk about that. Can we talk about that as a belief? Because that is Let's like, do it, brother. that is the one. So one of the questions I had for you was like, what are some of the religious beliefs that, that hold people back? And I think how we talk about the human being, how we talk about ourselves personally has been really detrimental. But then also I, I see this in the church all the time. So recently, more than once, I've heard from the pulpit and from, in, in some other places just even at my church, people say, oh, well, you know, I, I couldn't believe that God really loved little old me, right? Which, what does that say about what we think of who we are? What does that say about God and the junk he creates? Right. Yeah, about his his God, posture toward the them. junk man. Right. God, the creator of junk and trash. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really extolling the awesomeness of God. Call him the trash cr- creator. That, that'll make him happy. I feel like that needs to be a book. <laughs> <laughs> when God creates trash like me. Right. Oh, okay. I may have to, I'll write that down, but that's a, uh, but yeah, that, that is a belief that some of us have. And I get that there's that sin exists and that there, we absolutely need him. But if we have that posture of we're not lovable and I don't know why God loves us, if that's the belief that we have, how are we going to ever accept his love? We're going to keep trying exactly. to earn it. Yeah. There, there is no, but you can't earn his love. There's nothing you can do, nothing you can say, no actions you can take. There's absolutely zero that you can do to earn God's love, which, by the way, is a belief that I did not hold prior to probably 2010. I may have said those words. I may have even preached those words, but... Deep in the recesses of my soul, Eric, I never truly believed those words. I believed that I could earn his love, and I lived according to that belief, and th- that belief caused me so much anxiety, worry, and pain. And in fact, the, the times when I was not living up, when I was not taking the actions that would cause him to love me, that would, would, would gain me his affection and his favor and his blessing on my life, 
There were so many times where I went weeks, months, or even years of my life feeling unworthy of God because of the actions, because I wasn't worthy of his love, because I wasn't doing the things to earn it, to be worthy of it. And therefore, that was weeks, that was days, weeks, months, or years of my life where I literally did nothing for God. I, not, I, didn't, I didn't touch the people that he wanted me to touch. I never shared the message he put on my heart because I was too freaking ashamed of myself to do what God put me on this earth to do. And God, it, 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 today, how did I break free from that? Well, it, I, I had a wake-up call. Finally, I learned that there is absolutely, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No means zero, none, nada, ever. Amen. I love that later on in that passage, there's a, there's a rhetorical question where Paul says, if, if God doesn't condemn us, who can condemn? And yeah. or, or it says, who can condemn? And there's... Um, it, you can't see it in the English, but in the Greek, it's structured in a way that that's, it's a rhetorical question with an implied answer of absolutely nobody. And so I'd love to think about that and go, okay, that means my parents can't condemn me. My friends can't condemn me. I can't condemn myself, which I think is that we go back to that loving ourselves, learning to love ourselves. I can't and do that because God doesn't do other, that. Some other things that broke me free from this is that, have you ever heard of the parable of the incredibly loving father? Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, I know that it doesn't go by that usually. <laughs> what does it usually go by? The prodigal son or right. the lost son. The, the lost son. All right, so I remember hearing a, this story from a whole new perspective, and it really uh, – it, it, it was just one more chink in the armor. You know, there's these chains that were literally I, – I was a prisoner inside of my own soul. And this, when I heard about the parable, the incredibly love, loving father, which by the way, Jesus never told this story and said, Hey, I want you to write down and call this the parable, parable of the prodigal son or the par-. There was none of that. That's crap we came up with. And I hope you don't mind that I call it crap. No, it's all right. I just called it that anyway. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the thing is, is it was never the parable of the lost son. It's just a story. It was a parable that Jesus taught. And we choose to focus on the lost son thing and, and everything. But here's what I got out of that story. It's the, if you think about it, it's, the, it's a story not about a son who went and, 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 and completely went out to live a sinful life and said, give me my inheritance now. I'm going to go live my life according to my own measures. I don't need you. I'm going to go make my own way and blah, 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 blah. It's not about a son who did that and then came home and repented and sought the forgiveness of his father and said, please take me back and blah, blah, blah. That's not the story. Go back and reread it. It's not this. The, the son was never lost. The son was never lost. Reread the story and come at it from this perspective. Okay. The son goes, says, listen, I want my inheritance. You know, my brother will sit here and do things your way. He'll be, he'll, he'll, he'll do the straight and narrow. He'll be the responsible. I'm going to go live my own irresponsible life, do my own thing. I want my things my way. Give me my inheritance. And what does the incredibly loving father do? He goes and does it. He goes and gives it. Here it is for your enjoyment. Go and do whatever it is that's in your heart to do. And and here's what the interesting thing is. He goes out and he squanders it all, lives it in unrighteous life. Things got so bad that he lost all of his money. He's literally eating out the food out of the pig troughs or something of that nature. Yeah. Eric, you're more into theology and stuff it deeper. Am I, am I on oh, yeah. the right path so far? Yep. Yep. That's right. Okay. You, you tell me when I start preaching heresy here. Okay. 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 <laughs> cause, cause I'm sure it's coming. All right. <laughs> so hold on. Now I've got All my right. title. Okay, good. Okay. So he, here's the deal. All right, he's eating out of the pig trough. He goes, dude, my father's servants eat better than I do. I know what I'll do. I'll go back and I'll, I'll, I will plead, his, for, plead forgiveness and, and I will go and beg for him to forgive me and allow me to just at least be one of his servants, right? He feels the guilt. He feels the shame. He feels unworthy of his father's love. He feels like he's, you know, he, you, he, is, are, am I, is this still accurate oh, to yeah. the story? Okay, just making yep. sure. He's, he's rehearsing it the entire way. He's got his speech he's down. Exactly. He, 
He's even rehearsed. Matter of fact, the rehearsal of his speech is in this story. Right. Does he ever get to give the speech to his father? I think he does. He he gets there and he, he says not. it. Oh, he doesn't. Okay, go ahead. I believe he is cut off. Yeah. I know that that's the thing where we need to go and do the football. Let's can we get our instant replay? Right. Do you want to do this live? We could do this live. Okay. Let's find out. Let's go. I'll I'll look so, it up. We, We'll keep talking. We'll, we'll, I can make all kinds of voice sounds with my voice, <laughs> and, and people will be entertained. Do, 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 do. And Eric's going to look up the parable of the incredibly horrible son that we keep calling him, the one that freaked everything up and, and, and totally ruined his life until mm. he came back and begged for forgiveness. And his father says, well, as long as you promise to never do this again, right. um, then maybe I'll take you back. <laughs> right. That's, 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 that's not, not what happens. Remember the story. <laughs> That's so, not what happened. So he does get to say, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But he doesn't get to go to, he doesn't finish. He, he gets kind of. That's it. He gets cut off. Why? Because what does the father do? He says, bring the, bring the robe, bring a ring, get some sandals for this guy and kill the fatted calf. He throws okay. a party. So, so I was right that he got cut off. He didn't get the whole speech in. Right. He did not. Okay. Because the father says, listen, none of that, none of that. Uh uh-uh. uh, I don't need to hear you ask for forgiveness. Ooh, did Cliff just say that? Yeah, I'm just saying this is a story that some guy named Jesus told. I don't know. <laughs> um, so anyway, here's the deal. We get there, but wait a second. There's more to the story. All right. So here's the thing. He's walk. I mean, th- th- you know, he didn't drive drive up in his Honda. You know, so he's walking onto the, his father's property as he's cut, making his way back home. And his father sees him in the distance. Why? Because he's looking yep. for his son. He's waiting anxiously at all times, knowing that his son will return. He, he's never lost the attention. He's never lost the affection. He's never lost the love of the father. It's never been in question. None of it in all of the unrighteous living that he had just lived. The father never once counted any of it against him. And not only that, now this is something, Eric, I don't know if you'll have the background to do to say this, but I'm only telling you what I've heard from somebody else who has way more knowledge than I do. But in the story, does or does not the father hike up his robe and run towards the son to meet him? It says that he ran. So, yeah, that's probably what he had to do. Take his robe and tuck it in and take off. Now, I am not the expert here, but the person who told me this is Wayne Jacobson. (laughs) Okay. He said that in that culture, to do that would have been the most embarrassing and unacceptable thing to do in public. And do you want to know why he did it? Because by hiking up his robe and running to his son— he would be the talk of the town. The father would be the, the cause of all of mm. the fuss. Everybody in town is going to talk about how crazy that man is. And they're going to be ta- – I mean they're literally – did you hear what so-and-so did? He did this and blah, blah, blah. All of the gossip is now on the father. By taking his robe up and running towards the son – he has now taken all of the focus on everybody's gossip saying, did you hear that so-and-so is back in town? He did that as an act of love for his son before he brought out the pad of cows and certainly before he got even half of his apology in. Right, right. Yeah, oh yeah, he did because he saw him coming and so he does, so he does this. Interesting, I've never heard that uh, aspect of it, um, which makes sense from a, a first century you know, perspective. Really fascinating, but the, the so what that does is it puts the emphasis on the father, not on the son, right? It's and it's on the that love. What the story is about anyway, right? Yeah, that whole context in Luke fifteen. There's the lost sheep and there's the lost coin, but it always ends with this celebration of, hey, I'll, what was lost is found, and that God's posture toward us is that He's bringing us back. And and here's the thing, it, in every one of those stories, it's not on what is lost, but it's on the father who is right. never ending the search. Right, right, because he loves us. 
And what a different way to think about it. I've, I've often heard it. I'm sure somebody smarter than me said this, but the, uh, you start the gospel in, if in Genesis one made in the image of God, right. Instead of Genesis three, where, where the sin happens. Yeah. It matters. Matter of fact, the thing, the thing is, is, um, one of the, th- okay. So another belief I had to change, uh, you know, can, if we can just jump all over yeah. Christian beliefs that I had to get rid of, uh, I used to believe that I'm a sinner. I used to believe that that I'm a sinner, unworthy, you know, of whatever, and and, and so I'm a ju- I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Yes, I hear that all yeah. the time. And and the thing is, is I I'm a sinner. I'm always a sinner. I, blah 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 blah. I want to tell you that I changed that belief. I no longer believe that I am a sinner. I am not a sinner. Because if I tell you that I'm a sinner, then what I speak to you is that Jesus Christ's Sacrifice on the cross was not enough to wash me clean. I will tell you that I am righteous, I am blameless, and I am holy in the eyes of God, and that has been imputed on me. And that any sins that I had, past, present, and future, are wiped away from me, and they're as far as the east is from the west. Amen. Yeah. And that, but that's such a different perspective. I, I'm trying to wrestle with why do we get stuck in those? Like, I, I hear it, we've heard it preached. I've heard people say things like that, you know? Um, but why do we get stuck there? Why is that the belief? And I don't know, maybe it's a misinterpretation of scripture, but it really does damage people. I think, I think it doesn't help us help us see who we really are. I'm convinced. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I'm convinced that what God made us for isn't just, um, to just be these little automatons who will show up and just do whatever he wants us to do. Right. I'm convinced that he made us, if you look at the end in revelation, it says that we will rule and reign with him, which means he's made us to, he's designed us to be people who take care of the environment and who do these things and, um, you know, go, who go out and, and be his representatives, uh, wherever we happen to be on, on the new earth or whatever that looks like. And back to what you said earlier yeah, in Genesis, right. we were made in the what? In the image of God. And the, and God is a creator. Right. All right. Did he, or did he not take joy in his creation? He did. Okay. And he has given us the gift and ability to create ourselves. And he wants us to create. And he also wants us to take joy in our creation. Did he or did he not several times throughout scripture says, be joyful always. And again, I say rejoice. Yeah, absolutely. That's what he wants. He wants us to be joyful always. Yeah. And that's, it's hard to do that if you're thinking of yourself as being a terrible person. Being a yeah. sinner, like you were saying, the the trash the trash that God created, right, right. <laughs> Going back to that one, right. So, hey, I love that. Not only that, another one for you. What what if I told you that God has given us everything for our enjoyment? Yeah, well, I'm in on that one. I like that. That's in First Timothy six seventeen and eighteen, by the way. Yeah. So, how does that? If we don't believe that, how does that play out for people? Well, how does it play out? God gave us everything for our enjoyment. It's kind of like most people that I grew up with in the Christian faith. God gave us most things so that we could be responsible stewards and do the right thing. And if we don't, God's going to punish us. That's, that's the God I grew up with. Right. And it, and I, and I discovered a disconnect between the God I grew up with and the God in the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. So I love that about enjoyment I think too one one that I really struggle with is the idea that uh, the physical is bad and the spiritual is good. Oh yeah, have you seen that? Like, oh yeah. Well, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Uh, look that one up. It's in yeah. the Old Testament. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Something, 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 something. I don't remember the rest of it. Yeah, the heart. Yeah, I can't remember if that's in Proverbs or Jeremiah. But the thing about Jeremiah is he ends up going, "I'm going to give them a new heart," which is what you were yeah. saying earlier. That's exactly it. You know, the thing is, is when Jesus came in and we accepted his gift, 
we were imputed righteousness. We were given a new heart, a new spirit, and we are therefore now no, we no longer live by the flesh. Right. We live by the spirit of God. Wow. Yeah. How freaking awesome is that? It is awesome, but it's hard to live into, I think. And I think that's because of some of these beliefs. That's a belief. That's a belief. And here's what I want to tell you, Eric. If you believe it is hard to live into that, guess what will happen? You (laughs) will choose to make it difficult to live into that. Eric, I want to tell you it is easy. I I used to believe it was difficult. I do not. You know how I – do you want to know how hard it is to live into it? Yeah. I wake up and boom. Wow, how freaking awesome is my day? God, thank you. <laughs> that's it. That's how hard it was. Yeah, that's, but that's, it's what is that? that? It's only hard. It's hard if you make it hard. If you believe it's hard, it's hard. The thing is, is do you think that God wants it to be hard for you? No, I don't think so. Then stop it. Have yeah. you ever seen the Bob Newhart you, YouTube yes. video? Yeah. Go, guys, if you've never seen this, go to YouTube and do a, a search in YouTube to put Bob Newhart, stop it. You'll laugh your butt off for six and a half minutes and then come back. <laughs> right. And then I will tell you, the next time you try to make it hard to live out the awesome joy of God and, and just the easiness of, of embracing his grace and his love and his mercy every single minute of every day, which is always new and unlimited, there is neither height nor death, neither di- angel nor demon nor anything on this planet that could separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. It is so easy. And if you ever choose to make it hard again, you just need to stop it or I'll bury you alive in a box. (laughs) Good to know. (laughs) Okay. So one of my questions I wrote down was why is it hard to change our beliefs? But then I'm, that's a belief. So, uh, how do we rephrase that? Changing your belief is how do you change your beliefs is a better question. That is a much better question. Okay. Let's go with that one. All right. So how do you change your beliefs? Number one, uh, first and foremost, you must have a dream. It's required it, It's required that you have a dream for you to really, truly change your beliefs because the reality – by the way, you already know some beliefs that need to be changed, mm-hmm. and you could skip to skip step two, all right? The, the problem is is the, the reality is if the reason why you want to change your beliefs because there's a gap between what it is that you say you want out of life and what you currently have, right? Right. So, so the thing is, is – and, and, and what you want is what your dream is. And so if you don't know what your dream is, you're not going to know why you're not doing it yet. So, and, and, and we'll get to step two in just a moment. For those of you who already know what your limiting beliefs are, I'll tell you how to change them in just a moment, I'll give, or at least to give you a step two. But I promise you, if you're going to just like try to skip 30 seconds ahead and you skip step one, you're going to miss out because you're only aware of about maybe 10 to 20% of your limiting beliefs. You are unconscious of 80% of the things that you believe deep in your heart that you've never once consciously thought of. You are not consciously aware of 80% of the beliefs that are causing you to do the things you do that you shouldn't do or that are keeping you from taking action that you you, you say that you want to do, but you can't ever actually sustain it long term. So step one is you have to have dreams. You have to be able to allow yourself to rediscover the dreams that God planted. God knew us before he knit us together in our mother's womb. He prepared for us a future, a hope. He, he prepared prosperity for us, which is, means that we're going to be prosperous in achieving the dreams that he created us to do. It's not just financially, although there's nothing wrong with that either. Amen. Anyway. So the thing is, is that he's got these dreams. So number one, you need to discover and connect with your dreams. That's going to help you really uncover what your real true identity in Christ is. All right. Once you become aware of that, you say, okay, what's my dream? What do I need to pursue to live the life that I feel God is definitely calling me to live? What work should I do in my physical health, financially, in my relationship with my spouse, my kids, whatever it is, what are my dreams? What do I want that I don't have? that God is clearly calling me to pursue. Then you ask yourself the the next question. What would I need to do? What would I need to change? What would I need to start doing to actually take a couple actions to get me closer to living that dream? What one or two, three, maybe three things that I need to start doing, actions, behaviors, that I need to begin to get me closer to that? And then the other question is, what one, two, or three behaviors 
are bad habits in my life that I need to eliminate? What do I need to get rid of to get me closer to that goal faster? Okay. Now, when you have what you, I want you to do is ask those questions about each of those goals that you have and the answers as far as uh, uh, you, know, you know what you need to do. Ask yourself and then write down the answers to these questions. Why have I not already started taking this action? Why have I found it so difficult to stop this bad behavior? And what you will start writing down are beliefs. And by the way, you might call them excuses. I just got off the phone with somebody who, who swears it was his wife's fault. <laughs> Everything was his wife's fault. My yeah. wife's negative attitude, my wife's this, my wife. It's like, dude, you're wrong. Your wife has nothing. To, your, your wife has no control over what you think and what you believe. And, and until you get out of the victim mindset, you'll never take ownership for your life. And other people will always help. You, you'll always find the blame somewhere else. So I'm going to tell you right now, that's not it. That's a limiting belief that you need to eliminate now. He was not aware that he had an eliminating belief that he was the, is playing the victim. And so what you're going to find out is you're going to come up with lots of excuses of why you haven't started yet. I don't have the right website for the thing. I'm t I just, Eric, I just had mm -hmm. somebody who's been trying to create a coaching business for three years and hasn't landed client. Why haven't you, what, what would you need to do? Well, I, I would need to actually start getting some paid clients and stuff like that. Or what are one, two or three actions that you could take? And, and he's like, well, I need, I, and, and actually he, he caught some load and police there. He's because I need to create a website. And every time I find, it's like, why haven't you done that? Well, every time I find somebody who, who would do my website, it turns out they, they get halfway through the project, I pay them half, and then they don't show up, and I never get it done. And I was like, let me tell you something. First of all, I can go straight to a limiting belief that you need a website to actually land paid coaching clients. Right. It's not true. It's a lie. Guess what? Before the internet, people got paid to coach. <laughs> what really, what really is keeping you from coaching? Let's get down to the whole thing about the fact that you feel like you're unworthy, the fact that you don't have enough uh, qualification, that you're not, that you don't have enough experience, that there are other people out there better than you, that nobody would want to listen to you, that you're afraid that you're going to be. Let's get to the real beliefs here, and that's what. So that's what we do. So you you yeah. gotta you gotta ask yourself, what should I do? What do I need to start doing? Why haven't I done it? What do I need to stop doing? Why do I keep messing it up? Why do I keep going back to it? Write down all of your excuses, what you have are beliefs, and most of those are limiting beliefs that are untrue. And then you got to find out why do you believe those things. So first is be so step one, have a dream and and then go through that process. Step two, now you're now you've become you you are now aware, you're aware of your limiting beliefs. So the next step is you want to actually discover what is the origin of those beliefs? Where did they came come from? Sometimes you overheard mom and dad arguing about money and they said some very hurtful, mean, nasty words to one another. And all of a sudden you made some associations in your brain. It was a very emotional time for you when you were seven years old. And you said, man, every time somebody tries to do something to save up money for something that they don't need, it causes marriage strife. And so therefore, you've actually got this belief that you can't save up money for things that you don't need because it's going to ruin your marriage. You didn't know that you had that belief until you really did the work. And now that you know the belief, now you realize and you start asking yourself, well, where does that belief come from? And by the way, Eric, I do this all the time with people. I said, where does that belief come from? I have no idea. <laughs> right. Do you, know what the, do, do you know what my next question is? What if you did know? What if you did know? <laughs> yeah. That's exact. How did you know that? I've, I've heard... I've listened. Heard it before. <laughs> I said, so what if you did know? And then I sit there and said, I, and by the way, as far as I'm concerned, I'm available for the next 90 minutes. And if it, if we have to sit here in dead, absolute silence for the next 90 minutes, I'll wait because I promise you the answer will come. So I'm going to ask you again, where did that belief come from? And it usually takes, it's, it's somewhere between 15, 20 seconds. I've actually waited about three minutes in silence. Wow. And the beliefs come. And the thing is, you have to dig them out. You have to go. It's, it's, I'm not a dentist, but you have to go in and do a root canal on these beliefs. And you have to take it out by the roof because if you don't, the weeds are going to come back up again. Yeah. No amount of positive thinking is going to be able to outdo the, the root cause of your problems. Positive thinking is nothing more than medication. 
you actually have to have positive beliefs that have replaced the old ones. So first of all, you have to dream. You have to get to the place where you discover where those unconscious beliefs that you weren't aware of. Then you become aware of the belief. Then you find the origin of the belief, and then you evaluate that belief. You say, is this true? And most of the time it's like, well, no, duh, that's not true. I, I could swear I didn't. Ha- no, you did have it. Remember when you said this? Oh, yeah, I did say those words, didn't I? I guess I did have that belief. Yes, you did. And it's stupid, isn't it? Yeah, that's ridiculous. You've been living the last 43 years of your life based upon that belief. I said, do you think you could ever have that belief again as a, as a, uh, from this day forward? No, that's the most ridiculous belief in the world. Tell me why it's ridiculous. And I make them come up with four or five reasons why that's an absolutely ludicrous idea. And the thing is, is once you go through this process, you can never have that belief again. Right. You can't unsee it, right? Once you've seen it. You can't it. unsee it. The truth, has, the truth will set you free. Right. I'm convinced that that's a lot of what Jesus was trying to do as well. When he, when he talks to people and, uh, you know, he, he is trying to rattle them to get them down to the, to the core of, of what they believe about who God is and how they, how they get to him. Cause he w- was dealing with all these people who are all performance based and he's trying to say, no, that's, that's not it. Don't worry about the performance. I'm telling you something even, even deeper. Yeah. So we, we talk about the woman who was caught in adultery and, and and we focus on the story, go and sin no more, right? Go and sin no more. That's not the focus of that story. Right. The focus of that story is this woman was just caught having sex with someone <laughs> mid-act. Right. And they drag her out half naked in front of Jesus and said, look at what we found. What does the law say? The law obviously says that this woman needs to be stoned to death. And Jesus says, okay. He of you, he of you who stands among us without sin, you cast the first stone. And of course, what happens? They all drop their stones because ain't none of them living a perfect life. Right. Right. Jesus, the only one who could have thrown the first stone, didn't do so. And he says, instead, he says, lady, where, woman, where is your accusers? And she says, they've all gone away. He says, and here's the focus, nor do I accuse you. Guys, you, you ask, does he say go and sin no more? Yeah. Basically, what does that mean? In translation from my beliefs today, go and live your life according to the way that you know that God would want you to live because he's given you a prescription of how to enjoy everything he's provided. Right. There's a but freedom in that. Still, if you go and f- if you mess it up again, I still not going to accuse you. Yeah, exactly. I love that. I, and I think that's, that's, but that's, I don't know. So many of us wrestle with it. So I guess that's a belief that we believe God is going to condemn us, that God is after us. He's going to come and get us um, in a bad way, right? He's, he's going to, he's going to punish us if we don't, if we don't just do all the right things. And dude, I can't be, you know, I told you I had an eclectic background of faith, right? I've sat under some hellfire and brimstone preaching, (laughs) and I've heard specifically from the pulpit at least 50 times within my life that God is going to burn you to the ground and and, and he's going to chase you down and lightning's going to get you. Uh, And if you were to die in a in a matter of on, on, uh, I'm not going to say which faith background, but if you die, uh, having created a mortal sin at, before you uh, have the, uh, the, the, what do you call it? The, the, um, the one, one of the sacraments of confession, then you're going to burn in hell. If not, it, maybe spend the rest of your life in purgatory, depending on if we still believe and teach that yet. Right. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dude, it's so messed up, and it's not who God is. Amen. Amen. I love that. And so I wanted to just explore that, and I th- I'm glad we did, because I think so many of these beliefs, it, what happens is then people start to question them. They don't have this kind of strategy to to focus on it and, and dig into it, and they probably don't have people who can who can do that. They tend to get a little bit messy, and uh, then their church just abandons them as well, which is, is really... Um, 
even even harder, and that breaks my heart. That Wait just makes me upset. I want to I want to I want to challenge you on that. Their church abandons them as well. Okay. What, what get, phrase that in a different way that I might be able to to swallow those words because I can't swallow those. Well, words. so I just think when you when you go what through is those their church, what, what is the church? Uh, oh yeah yeah okay. The church is yes. I see what you're saying. So the church is is us. We are the church. Um. So. But the people who they are in community with also okay, so the, abandon the them. religious country club organizations that yes. meet together on a consistent basis to abandon them. Yes, the five hundred one c three they've been attending on a weekly basis. <laughs> I just wanted the congregational gatherings. Uh, some of those folks abandon them. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I heard that correctly. <laughs> yeah, you bet. <laughs> I okay, told you I was going to be a heretic. On this yeah, that's good. No, we talked about this in in our last conversation about about how uh, the definition of the church. And so, uh, yeah, that's good. You guys can go back and find that if you want. Um, <laughs> or not, it doesn't matter. Or not, whatever. Um, yeah, but anyway, I just think it, get, it gets hard, right? People tend to get messy when they're dealing with these things and that pe- others don't always want to deal with that because it's easier if they're stuck in their beliefs to not have to be challenged by their beliefs well, it's changing. it's easier to not actually do anything that causes, that causes you to, to exert effort and energy. And let's be serious. The thing is, is it's going to be effort and energy for you to be intentional about doing the work necessary to actually understand what beliefs you have and why you have them. It's it. I will grant Eric that it is much easier to sit in a pulpit or to sit in a pew and allow a pulpit, uh, somebody in the pulpit to download your beliefs for you. And I will tell you that that's not what the Bereans did. Yeah. The Bereans actually did something different than that. And they did exactly what you and I are talking about here. They tested everything. They did not blindly accept anything that was taught to them. They tested it amongst the spirit of God. Yeah. And they dug within them. They dug into the scriptures and they compared it with that to see, all right, where, where are we? What, what do we believe that or not? Yeah, that's good. That's, that's, that's what we should all do. Um, and by the way, if you choose not to do that, God still is not going to judge you. And he's going to love you regardless of whether or not you understand he loves you or not. You're just going to sit there and feel like he doesn't love you. And it's not going to make you enjoy life. And if anything, that's going to cause you to sin because then you're refusing to do what God wants you to do, which is to enjoy your life and love yourself so that you can love others like you love yourself. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can we talk about that that belief a little bit? Love, loving yourself. Sure. We, we talked about this a little bit last time, but it's I the think second greatest commandment in every right? every all, all the entire law, anything, anything, and everything ever given handed down by God as law and commandments, all of it is summed up in two: love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, everything you got. That's commandment number one. Commandment number two is to love yourself above others. Yeah, right. Love. Yes. <laughs> I had to think about it. Yes. Love others as, as yourself. But you, for you to love others as yourself, what precedes loving others as yourself? You have to love yourself. And the reason why so many Christians get a bad rap for being terrible in the way they treat others is because they don't love themselves, therefore they don't have the capacity to love others any better than they love themselves. Why are, why are most Christians judgmental, critical, condemning, hateful towards other people? Because that's how they love themselves. Yeah, and that's, that's so detrimental, right? How, how can you live that way? You can, but it's not thriving. If you're married, are, are you married, Eric? Yes, I've been married. Well, okay. next month, 23 years. Here's what I want to tell you. If you ever get into a situation where you are condemning yourself, you're beating yourself up, you're saying mean, nasty things to yourself, that's no different than you using those same words to your wife. Which, and it's, wh- by the way, which would be spousal abuse. It's verbal spousal abuse. Right. But, okay. So there's a belief in there, right? That we're, that we're using 
that we're operating in when we treat ourselves that way, which is what we're not worth it or we're not, we deserve it. We, we, we were an accident created by God and, and we, we, we were in the reject pile in the trash bin. Yeah. That's who we are. And if you believe that, I, I don't know, maybe you got a, you've, you've got an imperfect God and I would consider I would actually suggest you abandon that guy. There you go. How about that one? Go That's seeking good. a new God. That's probably what I would recommend that you do. One that doesn't throw you in the trash bin. Uh, no, no doubt. Yeah, that's well put. Okay, well, that'll get me some email. <laughs> I, I, I told you, dude. <laughs> uh, the heresy episode with Cliff Ravenscraft. Yeah, that'll be fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Send your emails to Eric. <laughs> I'm really enjoying that. All right. Well, cool. Yeah, I, I th- that's really what I wanted to talk about. Here's what happened for me when we were at uh, Free the Dream last year. We, you were talking about a lot of this stuff. And I wrote down in my, in my journal, like, why don't I see this taught in church? I mean, if really what happens, or in, in my gathering, right? So if really what happens is we believe that God is uh, changing us so that we can uh, live an abundant life in in Christ, learning how to change our beliefs seems like a really core and fundamental issue, right? It seems like something we should know, but that was the first time I'd ever heard it. And I couldn't believe it. It blew is, me away. So so you're, you're the theologian guy com, uh, compared to me. Uh, as a man thinketh, so is he. Yeah. I mean, isn't that a, that's a scripture? Right? Yeah, it is. All right. Whatever you believe will come into fruition. I will tell you when you pray, you must believe because if, if he who doubts it, I mean, it's beliefs are everywhere in the Bible. Yeah. This stuff isn't new agey pseudoscience, uh, you know, stuff that's going to send you to the slippery slopes of hell where you're going to burn in sulfur, wherever that is in the Bible. Um, <laughs> which it's not, but that's another thing we get a lot of our, there's two things. We get a lot of our beliefs about hell and heaven from Dante, which is where that comes from. And then we get a lot of our beliefs about like the garden of Eden and then male and female relationships from Milton, which is just really kind of weird actually. Yeah. They're not scriptural. Yeah. But the, but the thing is, is all these things that we're talking about in here, they are in scripture. It, there, there's yeah. clear evidence that that God wants us to change, be intentional about what you believe. Yeah, and particularly I would say about yourself and and His posture towards you, because what He wants is for you to come to Him, and that doesn't mean I, I came in. I did not come to the world to condemn it, but I came to what? I came to give life, life to the full. Yeah. An abundant life. That's what I came. I did not come to the world to condemn it. I came to save it. Yeah. And imagine if that, if we changed that belief that God was condemning, that would change everything. It, it changed my life. Yeah. Amen. Wow. All right, Cliff, what else do we need to cover here? What, what else is, uh, should, should we say? Cause we're already, we're already pushing an hour. All right. Well, uh, I would say, God's grace and his mercy is endless. You, you have to do zero to earn it. It's already provided. It's a free gift, done deal, signed, sealed, delivered, pre-postage paid, all of that stuff. And it's not hard. You can just choose to accept it and say, thank you. That's, that's it. And by the way, you don't even have to do that. It's still yours anyway. So just live it. Be joyful always. Be anxious about nothing. Again, he says rejoice. Don't put your hope in your wealth if you happen to be wealthy, but instead make sure that you put all of your hope in God who richly is providing you with every resource you need for your enjoyment. Be joyful always. That's all we need to cover. Do all of that. Come to Free the Dream Conference if you're struggling with any of this. FreeTheDreamConference.com. And if you go to FreeTheDreamConference.com, you watch all the testimonials there, you're not immediately convinced to come to this event that will literally teach you how to radically change what you believe. 
and get you different results in your life, then go over to mindsetanswerman.com slash for free, where for one hour, you will hear me teach the basics of how to completely radically reset your belief system. I mean, in one hour, it says at the top of that page, if you go to mindsetanswerman.com slash free, if you, it, it says, give me one hour and I'll teach you how to live the life of your dreams. And if you think that that sounds too bold, too crazy, go to mindsetanswerman.com slash free. There's a 90 second video clip that if that doesn't grab your attention, then, well, you probably check. You're not even listening to my voice at this point anyway. <laughs> I, I ticked you off. I ticked you off like more than 45 minutes ago. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's all That's all we need to cover, Eric. Perfect. And I, apolog- I apologize in advance for all the emails that you're going to get. Well, it'll be all right. I'll just forward them right to you. <laughs> that's fine. And I'll archive them immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Oh, I love it. Cliff, you are always an inspiration to me. I consider you a mentor. So thank you for coming on and just sharing some of this with us friends. Again, you can get that. It was at mindsetanswerman.com slash free. Yes. That's where you can go. And then you can also go, was it free the dream? Conference.com. Free the dream conference.com uh, to go there. I went last year with my daughter, Emily, and it was fantastic. And I would, uh, couldn't recommend it more highly. So Thanks, Cliff. I appreciate it. Eric, this has been an awesome, enjoying, enjoyable conversation. And if it was just you and I who had this conversation and nobody else listened, thank you for the opportunity. 